Welcome, 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 welcome to Lesson 5, Chapter 5 of the Book of Revelation, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. This is one of my most favorite books because it is in heaven. It's worshiping God. There's singing. There's praise. There's the glory of God from the start to the finish. This has this chapter has several sections. We see the scroll of the Lamb of God that has the seven seals. And we see angels falling at the feet of the Lord in worship. And one of my favorite verses I'm going to read is, and every, living, and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, and this is the important part, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be the blessing and the honor and the glory and the might forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Did you catch that one little phrase about the creatures under the earth? Well, that's my little tease. Stick with me and we'll discuss what possible creatures could be praising God under the earth. Do we have worms? Let's see. See you on the other side. The Lamb and the Seven Sealed Book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, Chapter 5. And so it begins, just as it was predicted in the book of Daniel, written about 530 B.C., a mere 2,550 years ago, recorded in Daniel 7, 13-14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. I will admit, I was guilty, as are many folks, with previously minimizing the importance of the Old Testament to the Christian faith. But reality is, our faith is dependent on a deep understanding of the history, miracles, and glory of God displayed, shown to us in the Old Testament narrative of the work of God, since the very creation of the world. Daniel is a profound book describing the sweep of human history from the first world ruler, Nebuchadnezzar, to the final ruler, the Lord Jesus Christ. What Daniel saw and wrote about is still in process. Some of his visions are now history. Some are rapidly becoming current events. We now see John's vision of a similar scene as Daniel had just described, only from a different perspective. Chapter 5 of Revelation is a continuation of chapter 4, the throne room scene. I would imagine that there probably shouldn't have been a division between the content in chapters 4 and 5. Well, except for a break we humans might need in comprehension of what is happening. So let us continue in Revelation 5, 1 to 5. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, 
The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. The word that the New American Standard Bible translates as book is the Greek word biblion and would better be translated as scroll as it is in the New New Legacy Bible translation and other translations. This scroll was most likely a parchment material rather than animal hides as it had writing on both the front and the back. For years and years, I was confused as to how a scroll could be sealed with seven seals where the scroll could be opened partially up to the next seal, which was then broken and allowing it to be unrolled more. I have read multiple explanations, and I am still not certain how it was done, but at least I figured out one way that satisfies me anyway. If you roll the scroll to the point you want it sealed, you could then press the seal into the side, bending the soft wax top and bottom, and then continuing rolling until it was tied closed and the last seal was placed in the center over the tie as we would normally think a seal was placed. That is my speculation only. I have no proof or scholarship on that, but it allows me to stop worrying about it anyway. Reality is, the important part of sealed with seven seals is not how the seals were placed, but that there were seven seals on the document. That information gives us an identity to the type of document we are seeing. Roman law required a will to be sealed seven times. The scroll we are seeing in Revelation being handed from God the Father to Christ the Son is the will, the title deed of the earth, or some call it the title deed of the universe. This scroll is the title deed of all that God created. And surprise, surprise, there doesn't seem to be much controversy about this. By and large, scholars agree with this identification. I suppose controversy exists, but to date I have never heard a different explanation of the identity of this scroll. No controversy, so we can move on. Verses 2, 3, and 4. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Now I am going to quote from John MacArthur's commentary for an explanation of these verses with a little commentary on his commentary. The strong angel is not named. Some identify him as Gabriel, others as Michael. But since the text does not name him, he must remain anonymous. My comment on Johnny Meck's commentary, while we cannot be dogmatic about this in any way, I'm voting for Gabriel here. Gabriel was quite involved in explaining the visions God gave to Daniel. Gabriel announces to Zacharias that Elizabeth would have a child in her old age, and to Mary that she would have a child by the Holy Spirit of God. Gabriel seems to be the head of the herald angels. Not that it matters a hill of beans to our doctrinal integrity, but I'm voting this strong angel is Gabriel. Back to John's commentary. He spoke with a loud voice so that his proclamation would penetrate to every corner of the universe. The angel sought someone both worthy and able to open the book and to break its seals. Who, he asked, has the innate, virtuous worthiness of character and divine right that would qualify him to break the seals? And who has the power to defeat Satan and his demon host? to wipe out sin and its effects, and to reverse the curse on all creation. But as the echoes of his cry receded, there is only silence. 
The powerful archangels Michael and Gabriel do not answer. Uncounted thousands of other angels remain silent. All the righteous dead of all the ages, including Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Moses, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Peter, and the rest of the apostles, Paul, and all the others from the church age say nothing. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. As we consider this question being asked, I believe it is reasonable to understand that primarily this proclamation, this question by the strong angel was actually a very rhetorical question. God, of course, knows that only his son has the right to this document. However, it does give anyone else in all the universe one last time to challenge God and his sovereignty. But no one, not even Satan, takes up the challenge. By the way, I think it is possible that way back in a corner of this throne room, somewhere out of the spotlight, behind the myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, that Satan himself is observing all that is happening. And as we will see in just a few minutes in verse 13, is giving praise. Now, it might not be willing, but I suspect it is happening. The reason I believe that Satan may be present, even if not mentioned, is he has yet to be permanently banned from heaven at this time. That happens in chapter 12. Yet, Satan knows he is about to lose control of the earth. So why does John begin to weep again? I pray you do not find me lazy, but John MacArthur quotes W.A. Criswell in his explanation of why John the Apostle begins to weep. Actually, I believe that sob is a better word here than weep. This quote I found find it better than anything I would ever write or even think. John's tears represent the tear of all God's people through all of the centuries. Those tears of the Apostle John are the tears of Adam and Eve driven out of the Garden of Eden as they bowed over the first grave as they watered the dust of the ground with their tears over the silent, still form of their son, Abel. Those are the tears of the children of Israel in bondage as they cried unto God in their affliction and slavery. They are the tears of God's elect through the centuries as they cried unto heaven. They are the sobs and tears that have been wrung from the heart and soul of God's people as they looked on their silent dead as they stand before their open graves, as they experience in the trials and sufferings of life, headaches and disappointments indescribable. Such is the curse that sin has laid upon God's beautiful creation. And this is the damnation of the hand of him who holds it, that usurper, that interloper, that intruder, that alien, that stranger, that dragon, that serpent, that Satan devil. And I wept audibly for the failure to find a redeemer meant that this earth in its curse is consigned forever to death. It meant that death, sin, damnation, and hell should reign forever and ever, and the sovereignty of God's earth should remain forever in the hands of Satan. I admit that many times in my life, many times, when someone has died or gotten seriously ill or suffered any type of severe loss, I know I have mourned deeply and the same thought has come into my heart. It is not supposed to be like this. Death is wrong. Death is not natural. We are not supposed to die. And while that is a gut reaction, not a doctrinal response, it is accurate. We were created to live in Eden, walking and talking with God. 
I do not know how people can live in this sin-cursed world without the hope of eternal life. So I do not question John's tears in the moment. If I believed that this is all there is, I also would be sobbing uncontrollably. But God... One of the elders went to John. I imagine that he placed his hands on the apostle's shoulders and said in verse 5, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. No need to sob. Behold, pick up your head. Look the Savior of the world. He can break the seals, open the scroll. John would have been very familiar with the descriptions of the Lord being the lion from the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, 8-10 says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. The description of the Lord coming from the root of David is seen in Isaiah 11. Here the father of David, Jesse, is named. Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 10. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Then in that day the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Humanly, Jesus was heir to the throne of David from both his father's side as well as his mother's side. Spiritually, Jesus owns the earth as creator God, and Jesus redeemed the earth from man's rebellion by paying the penalty owned by men through his death and resurrection. There is no angle that doesn't lead to Jesus being King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and Sovereign of all creation. Again, at the risk of seeming to not be working hard on this lesson, I am just overwhelmed with my inadequacy to improve on this text. It is understandable and straightforward in its meaning. I'll just make a few comments at the end. Besides, You receive a blessing from hearing God's words, not mine. Revelation 5, 6-14 And I saw between the throne with four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saint. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea 
and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. John MacArthur references an observation made by Dr. D. G. Barnhouse that there are four things out of place in the universe. The church, which should be in heaven. Israel, which should be in peace, occupying all the land promised to her. Satan, who belongs in the lake of fire. And Christ, who should be seated on his throne, reigning. All four of these anomalies will be set right when Christ takes the scroll from his Father's hands. The debt was paid for the sins of mankind about 2,000 years ago. Technically, legally, spiritually, the redemption of man is a done deal. The only reason that 2,000 plus years have passed is found in 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The Lord is growing his church. He will redeem everyone that God has elected since before time began. As long as the church is on the earth, this is an ongoing act. However, one thing to note is this scene in Revelation is happening after the rapture of the church. At this time, the church has been redeemed. It is a done deal. Men and women from every tribe and tongue and people and nation are a kingdom of priests. The only thing future regarding this vision of the church is their reigning upon the earth, which we will see accomplished in later chapters. At the beginning of the throne room scene, the spotlight was on the throne, 24 elders and four living beings. As the lights expand on the stage, suddenly coming to light are myriads and myriads, thousands and thousands. In the Greek language, the highest number they had was 10,000 or myriads. This expression is used to describe a number that cannot be counted. All are loudly proclaiming the majesty of God and his power, riches, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. What I want you to note is who is included in the every creature. Those that are in heaven, well, that is to be expected. And those that are on earth, None of my commentaries address this or the next group, so I'm in speculation mode now. This one must be future, as there is no indication that everyone on earth, at the moment this is happening in heaven, stops to praise the Lord. They should, and they will. Philippians 2, 10-11 tells us that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Currently, it is my opinion that we are living in a Romans 1 world. Verse 12 tells us the current thought processes of our culture. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Later, as we will see in Revelation 16, 9, that those on the earth possess hearts that have only grown colder toward God. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. So I do not understand the statement that every created thing on the earth is praising God at that moment. 
I also admit confusion with the next group mentioned. Every created thing under the earth. What? Worms? Well, maybe kind of. For most of my life, I have held a secret belief. I say secret because you are the first I've told about this for fear of being labeled a nutcase. But for most of my life, I have believed that hell is located in the center of the earth. That would be down from any point on earth. And our molten core is hot. So it made sense to me. Our interim pastor, Phil, recently taught on Philippians 2, 1 to 11, which obviously includes verses 10 to 11. Pay attention to the groups that will praise God. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Same groups, minus those on the sea. Hmm, that might be a clue as to the timing of this. Let me speculate about that in just a minute. Anyway, Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, mentions the same groups, including those under the earth. I asked Pastor Phil about this, pointing out the Revelation mess passage, and he said that many think that Shoal might be located in the earth. Wow. I was amazed to hear that other people thought that the spirits of demons and unregenerate humans were actually suffering in the core of the earth like I had believed. He cautioned me that this was not a hill to die on. We do not know this for certain, but it is not unreasonable to consider in light of the information we are given. As I considered this further over the week, I have slightly reconsidered my original conclusion. I heard Phil mention Shoal, which is a temporary hell-like holding place. Jesus mentioned it with another word, Hades, in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Hell-like, but not the final hell. Anyway, that is a lot of words to say that the final hell, the eternal lake of fire, cannot be located in the center of the earth. Reason? This earth, the one we are standing on, is temporary itself. Second Peter 3.10 reminds us that, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burnt up. We see the fulfillment of the second Peter verse in Revelation 20.11 in another heavenly throne scene. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. Later on in Revelation chapter 20, after the earth is destroyed, you hear that the sea, death, and Hades had given up the dead that were in them to stand before the great white throne judgment. I believe then, although I won't die on this hill, that currently those that have died without God are locked in Hades, and that Hades is most likely located under the earth, one of the layers of the core of the earth. We'll look at these questions closer as we look at chapters 20 21 in later weeks. For now, I encourage you to reread chapters 4 and 5 as one narrative. Imagine with your imagination and see the glory, the majesty, the power, the sovereignty, the great and mighty God, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, in front of whom we will sing, in front of whom we will fall down, in front of whom we will throw our crowns and say, with all the creatures that ever cre that were ever created, blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And the elders who fell down worshipped before our God.